Good afternoon, everyone. So far, so good, right? Thank you for joining us for the 2021 Summit on Poverty. And as we transition into the Social Development Commission's annual meeting, I am here with the distinct pleasure of introducing our close out keynote. I call them the closer. Uh, we're really excited about this keynote um, today because he is home, or one of our hometown favorites. He's called all over the world to keynote, but this will be his first large scale keynote in his hometown. So we are excited about his expertise. Dr. Ramel, Qu Dr. Kwaku Ramel Smith was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He is a product of the Milwaukee public school system and he continued his education at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater where he earned his Bachelor of Science in Psychology. He later went to the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee where he earned his Master's of Science in Educational Psychology and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Urban Education with an emphasis in school, psych in, in school psychology. He completed an American Psychological Association APA accredited clinical internship at a juvenile correction institution. Dr. Smith is a licensed psychologist in Wisconsin. He has served as a paraprofessional, special education teacher, and a school psychologist within MPS over the years. In addition to his work with MPS, he has worked with the Wisconsin Department of Corrections and Children's Hospital of Wisconsin as a clinical psychologist. Smith has also taught undergraduate and graduate courses in the areas of sociology, cultural diversity, orientation skill training, fiscal management, research and evaluation, group counseling and professional ethics at UW-Milwaukee, Marion University, Springfield College, Waukesha County Technical College, and Wisconsin School of Professional Psychology. Since 2007, Smith has been president of the Blacksmith Psychological Consult Cons Consultative Services. As a chief consultant, Dr. Smith works with the federal government, Washington DC Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services and Kansas University's SWIFT Urban Education Project to improve the educational outcomes for at-risk youth, adjudicated youth, and school districts in need of, of improvement. In addition to his work nationally, Dr. Smith strives to make an impact locally through providing training and support to area schools and agencies on the topics of violence prevention, trauma-informed care, foster care reform, and human trafficking. He has authored several scholarly journal articles in, and book chapters, edited a book and co-authored another book entitled Building a Better Man, a blueprint for decreasing violence and increasing pro-social behavior in men. Dr. Smith appears regularly as a commentator for local and national radio, television, and print news outlets. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kwaku Ramel Smith. This title, this title was inspired by one of the other, <clears throat> excuse me, the other speakers, uh, Keisha, raise your hand. I was in her group and I, one of the things that I don't wanna say before I do what I do is I, I've gotten a chance to be in this place. And when they bring a local person as a keynote, I think about all of the other local people who could have been keynotes. 
And I was in there and I've just been fed and fed and fed. So I'm, I'm so excited to bring this information to you. But I want you to know that it's been inspired by everybody that I've listened to and worked with, not only just these past couple of days, but especially. I just want to take a moment to pause. As is in the tradition of our ancestors, I am required to get permission from an elder to speak. As I start to get older, I see that, that that list is fewer and fewer, but I need an elder to give me permission to speak. Thank you. And that's my Nunu. If any of you have ever watched the movie Sankofa, you know what Nunu was as far as a spiritual inspiration of God's a queen. I give you your flowers in front of everybody. Whenever I do a speech, I always try to dedicate it to one person. Who ancestor spirit am I walking in who I want to embody, that I want to be able to do? And if you saw the title before, it was about walking in contradictions. And when we talk about walking in contradictions, I want you to think about the people who are on the screen. We think about Colin Powell, General Colin Powell, just passed away. He's a man of war. But yet when you hear him talk, he wanted to be a man of peace. He wanted to negotiate. And he said one of the things that he knew he would be best known for, but he didn't want to be remembered for, was lying to the UN about those weapons of mass destruction. And when I think about him, and I think about the turmoil it had to be to see what it was for war, not to want it, but to still have to send people there. When I look at Jelani Day, Jelani Day was a 25-year-old who was recently found dead, murdered. And when I think about how his story didn't get any national press, I was just upset because I see how so many other people get certain press when certain tragedies happen, and I want them to get that press. But when certain people don't, it just it, it bothers me in a certain way. Does anybody know who that man in the corner is, the left corner? No, in the corner. Ernesto Guevara, better known as Che. The reason why I put him up is because when he was young, he was a doctor. And he went around, kind of had like a gap year for himself. And when he did this gap year, he started to see all of the income inequalities among his beloved Argentine. And he said, I have to do something. So he switched from being a doctor who was healing people to a true guerrilla in the warfare. We know what his work was with Fidel Castro and helping her liberate Cuba. We know that he ended up dying in Africa, trying to help people all across the globe. We look at what we said here, John Brown. And this is brother Doc, where Doc at? Where Doc hitting that? He hit it on the button to say, he said, this is about everybody. If you don't know the story of John Brown, I'm gonna speak to it a little bit today. But John Brown is somebody who we call an ally, who we call an advocate, who we call a co-conspirator. He was a Calvinist preacher in the times of enslaved people. In fact, it was said that Frederick Douglass said that John Brown was a little too radical for him to hang with. So think about that, that ally. But the last person in that corner, you see that little baby boy, that's me. That's my mom, my cousin, my sister, my dad, and my uncle. If anybody really understand that picture, you probably understand some things already. We were going to visit my uncle. My uncle was a man of many, many talents. He could build anything. He could, he could fix anything. He was just, he could do whatever. But also with those same hands, he took two lives. And he was doing a double bid in Joliet. But all my life, people grew up telling me I was just like my Uncle Cliff. So imagine how that is as a young boy. So all my life, I've been grown up, raised around peas. And I want you to keep this. And as I talk about myself, I want you to think about yourself. How many people are here are familiar with the ACE study? Raise your hand. For those who are not, ACE study stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And most of the time when they talk about trauma, they talk about how were you traumatized? How were you hurt? And the ways you were hurt, then it talks about why you were hurt and why you might hurt other people. But one of the things people said, instead of always talking about trauma, why don't we talk about resilience? And if you look at this chart right here, it's 14 questions. And on the link is you, everybody will have access to all of these slides. So when you look at this, it talks about where you love. Does somebody care about you? Does somebody give you something? And when I look at my family, my community, my surrounding family, I said I was raised by a lot of peas, a lot of 
preachers and prophets and pastors and psychologists and, and professors. And I just had people pouring into me. I got a 14 out of 14 on that scale. And I was like, man, I'm blessed. But we talk about walking contradictions. This is the actual ACE study. They give you 10 questions talking about abuse and neglect, things you saw in your home, things that happened before you were the age of 18. They said if you score four or more, that your life trajectory will probably have tremendous difficulties. I scored a seven. And when I started to think about this, I started to think about myself, the walking contradictions within myself. As I'm here speaking, Abra said a lot of great things about me, and I appreciate you. But what she didn't tell you was all about me. She didn't tell you that I'm also 298082. And when I think about these walking contradictions and everything that we have in our lives, we want to think about how do we still make sense of all of this? What'd you say? What is it, Keisha? Make it make sense? And so when we talk about this, we want to talk about how do we make all of this make sense with what we're doing? These are my things for the day. Who has a microphone at the table? Because this is not my keynote, this is our keynote. So I need somebody to take this and read this for me. Because we got three things for the day. Hey, you know what I'm going to do? Let's take this over to our ally table right here. Thank you, thank you. Because what Doc said, sometimes people don't feel included. Tell, tell me when to stop. Right here. I need somebody to read this for me right here. <laughs> read it loud and read it with some emotion. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. So I want you to think about this. Because we're going out among the wolves. And we got to do some damage. We got to be wise as serpents or harmless as doves. Pass the mic to your neighbor. Read that for me, sir. Behold, I send you forth as No, sheep. the next line. The next line. The more, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Derek Bell, father of CRT. And CRT is what? Critical race theory. Last one. Pass the mic. If you are too weak to overcome habits that are obviously bad for you, then indeed your future is bleak. I Ching Book of Wisdom. And in the book of I Ching, I want you to think about this now. It says, if you are too weak to overcome habits that are obviously bad for you, then indeed your future is bleak. Now, this takes some real self-introspection for us to be honest with ourselves. We know what things we need to change. We all walk in contradictions up in here. So the young sister said yesterday, we so quick to judge people sometimes, not understanding what they go through. We all go through some things. So we say, how do we make this work? with all of these people. So I want you to think about all of the wonderful speakers we heard today, or this, this past week. Tawana Black. And what I think about and what I love about Tawana Black was she said, the system is performing the way it was supposed to be. But then at the end, she says, we need to equip, we need to connect, and we need to dismantle. Now everybody know Frederick Douglass. I want you to read this, next man. Read this quote. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what people will, will submit to and you have found out the exact amount of injustice and wrong which will be impressed upon them. And then, and these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows with, or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Did you get that? See, most of the times we hear just the beginning part of that. But he said either with words or with blows or with both. The limits of tyrants, they know what we're willing to accept and they won't go any further. But we got to push this. I remember I told you about John Brown. Read that one again for me too. Go ahead. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. 
I had vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. We got to build the base here. So, so let's build this foundation. You know how like in church, they start off kind of slow and then they keep building. So I want you to just work with me. I want you to build with me. And I want you to think about what the mayor Lumumba said. He said, the system is not performing. He said, it's overperforming. It's time for us to be unapologetically revolutionary. So I want you to just think about the theme of all of these things. This was the one quote that he had put in at the end. It's from a book called Invisible Child. But I want you to see right next to him with Paulo Freire. If you've never read The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, you need to get that. Because what he said is with this, this truth. Let me get my people to read again. Read that quote for me. I want to keep you all involved. True generosity consists precisely in fighting to destroy the causes which nourish false charity. True generosity and false charity. See, false charity is when people give you crumbs and then we give them awards. But if they really gave true generosity, we wouldn't need the false charity. So when we start thinking about where we're going, I want you to think about what Richard Rothstein said. Remember how beautiful that presentation was yesterday? No, and I'm, and I'm serious when I say that. Because the reason why well, I say Richard was that, because this is who we are. And this is really why you're going to get the speech you're going to get today. Because in the midst of all that adversity, we never stop. We never quit. We kept kind of go with them. But when he wasn't able to go, what happened with SDC? And I'm going to tell you, this is why I love SDC even more than I did when I first began here. Because they was willing to put themselves out in a transparent place. They said, you know what? We haven't been holding up to our values, to our obligations, to our duties. But you know what? We're about to. We're learning what we can do and watch what we're going to do. And if it hadn't been for that part, we wouldn't have got all of that out. So what I want you thinking about is this. How can we be more like SDC? Understanding that we're doing good, but it's so much more good that we can do. Now, he said Martin Luther King was nonviolent, and that march, that movement was nonviolent. But what do we see on the screen? You see the man of peace who was eventually assassinated, being brutally beat. When we see what Dr. Nagara wrote, he talked about what the schools, he said, education can mitigate poverty, can't heal it. It's a piece of it. And what I want everybody thinking about, what is your lane? What are you going to do? He said, parents, you build the schools. But on top of that, he said, well, you know what I need from you? I need you to connect globally. You see what he did? He said, hey, it was people saying things couldn't be done. So he took people to New York. He got information from Africa. So the old saying is, think locally, think globally, but act locally. We got to ask ourselves, how are we connecting? When we talked, to, when, when Mayor Lulamamba talked, he said, you know, one of the things I did, I'm concerned about Jackson, but I got a, co a covenant with all of these other mayors from the southern states, and we pulled together. So I want us to start thinking about this connectivity that we have when we talk about this. Mariah Parker, did y'all love that young sister? I'm going to tell you why I loved her, because it was a voice we don't normally get to hear, but she was transparent in a way that most of us won't be. She talked about feeling hurt and sad and suicidal. But she didn't just talk about a path. She talked about what she was currently going through. All of us look good right now. We smile and think about the pains, the inner pains and hurts that we have that nobody else knows what's going on, but yet we still keep doing the work. Well, the reason why the work suffers sometimes is because we're not honest with each other. And if I don't know you hurt, I can't even help you. I'm still pouring stuff on you. So what I love about this whole thing right here is they were saying a lot of things I was going to say. I was like, how do I pull this together in a different way? So I said, you know what? I got a kind of different lane. So I'm going to move and I'm going to use that lane within the field of mental health. And so when you see these objectives, we're we going to talk about trauma a little bit because we have to. That's one of the four that, that, that Aver talked about. We're going to talk about cognitive dissonance. But then we're going to get into a situation about how do we deal with I, with me, looking inside ourselves. One of the basic foremost things is to know thyself. It's normally credited to Socrates, but we know that it was Imhotep who stated it. But what I want you to think about is this, how well do I know myself? 
So many times we fool ourselves and that's where the real problems come. Then we're gonna talk about those solutions. Anybody ever heard this word syndemic? You've all heard it because we've been saying it. Really all it is, is multiple epidemics going on at one time. But see, we didn't start talking about this until COVID. Because we said, oh, we have COVID. We have George Floyd, like it was something new. But think about what we had going on before. We had problems with drugs. We had problems with AIDS. We had problems with poverty. We've been living in a syndemic. And when you live in a syndemic too long, it causes a breakdown in people physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. And then this is what we see and what we get, what we've been getting here. When you see trauma, I want you to think of this right here. Is anything that's hurt me? Is anything that hurt anybody who I love or who I care about? In fact, it's if anybody who I don't know has been hurt, but it shakes me because I wonder if that would have been me. When they talked about poverty and it being that thing saying, does it affect me? And some people could say, no, oh, we're going to get to this because it affects everybody, but it's the same way with trauma. Now, let's deal with it from a different standpoint with historical trauma. And this is the thing. We all in this room have some level of historical trauma. Whether it's our Japanese brothers who were put in those internment camps. Whether it's the refugees coming from Afghan now or some from the Middle East before. Whether it's our indigenous brothers and sisters, our Jewish brothers and sisters in the Holocaust. Even when we talk about suffrage, and even though we know there were some discrepancies in that, we talk about walking contradictions with women's suffrage, we think about the movement our sisters had to go through. And then we think about the Middle Passage. And this is the thing, people want to act like because something happened years ago, decades ago, centuries ago, like it doesn't affect us. When a woman is pregnant, do you realize she's pregnant with her grandchildren? Because all her eggs are there. So all of the eggs for her daughter and her daughter daughters are in there. So think about that pain that's passed along in those bones. And then think about what we call racial socialization. How do we raise our people based on what we went through? I'm gonna tell you something that's gonna seem a little weird, but I don't give my sons the talk anymore. You know what that talk is? Hey, if the police come, I want you to put your hands on the steering wheel, look them in the eye, and tell them, yes, sir, no, sir. So no, we're not going above and beyond. You're going to hold your head like a man. You're going to be respectful. You're going to be polite. But you're not going extra to make them feel comfortable. We're not about to do their job. Because when we tell them that, you know what it is? It's just like when some of our ancestors, for safety's sake, said, put your head down. Don't look. Somebody had to finally say, I ain't put my head down. I'm looking straight up. And then what came with that? Yeah, it came death, it came struggle, it came bloodshed. But tell me any time in the world where there's been any type of change where bloodshed was not involved. We look at the great dynasties of Egypt. They came by tumbling down. You look at the czars of Russia. You look at the emperors of China. I don't care what great society you're talking about. They eventually come crumbling down. And I want you to keep this in your mind when we think about this here. Let's look at us now. We talk about historical trauma. But let's just think about this right now when we think about who we're dealing with. When we talked about that age study, they said everything that happens by the age of 18. But we know from adolescent development that things are different in your brain from the time from your zero to five, from the time you're five to 11, from the time you're 12 to 18. So we think about all of the pains and the hurts that a person had in utero, that a person had growing up that you can't even remember, can't even articulate. And so when we wonder why people act the way they do, sometimes they don't even know because of the pain they had. How many times, well, one of my favorite movies is Boys in the Hood. And it's, it's, it's a movie where this man is shot and this girl brings his baby, this man brings his baby. And he said, get that baby, he don't need to see that. And they're thinking like, this is a baby, what, what, what are you talking about? But see, the brain records in ways that we can't understand. And this is an organ that we've seen hurt and pain that sometimes we can't articulate, but we feel. So when that baby's watching television and you don't think they know, when they have hearing those conversations, look at this difference of those brains. 
These are the new ones. These are the things that allow us to have intelligence. And the brain is 90% developed by the age of five. And see, that's our limbic system. That's our emotional brain. That's the visceral brain. That's the brain that snaps before you think. You just act it. And when something happens, that's what goes. So if when we go to that visceral state, and I don't care how educated you are, I don't care how many ties you own, somebody say something and push your butt, you say, you're going to see another side of me. And why is that? Because inside of our limbic system, that's the animal part of us. That's the part that's going to make us stay right. The rational brain, the frontal lobe that gives us the executive function, that's problem solving, delayed thinking, that don't develop till you're 25 to 28. So you think about how much pressure we put on our young people. You think about all of the stress we put on them, all of the expectations we have on them. You have a barbecue and you put a burger on the grill and it looked like it's ready. And then you bite it and you know it ain't ready. That's how so many of our babies' brains are. And so we expect them something that we ain't going to get. And then we punish them for doing something they're really not able to do. What all this boils down to is this, with all of the trauma that we have, whether it be historical trauma, whether it's racial trauma, whether it's gender trauma, this builds up in us. So when we start thinking about why we act the way we act, why we do what we do, well, if there's neurological deficits, guess what happens in school? What did Pedro tell us? He said, if we can't educate you, we incarcerate you. But if we not built in our school system to truly educate our people, well, we understand why the prison of pipeline exists. The real question is, why aren't we doing anything about it? But when you look at this scale that goes all the way up, think about our lives now. Think about how much dysfunction we have. Maybe we try to cover it up, but think about the level of dysfunction we have. And we're the helpers. When we see the level of hurt that we have, it's no surprise why. Because we carry so much pain inside of us, but we won't talk about it. And it builds up and it comes out in so many different ways. So now as it builds up, guess what happened? We develop these different dysfunctional skills. They said it's hard to get enough of something that almost works. So when we see somebody doing drugs, guess what? They're really trying to do better because it stimulates a part of their brain that makes them feel good to get them doing something. The only thing is it's got counterproductive effects. So what does this then lead to? It leads to early death. And whenever you look at any of the statistics, what do we start to see when we look at life expectancy? Who has the lowest rate of expectations, expect, expectation? It's amazing to me that we know these things, but we don't do anything about it. I'm not going to go over all of these signs of trauma because you're going to get the slide, but I want you to just look at this slide right here. Ask yourself, are, are you experiencing any of these things? Anybody who you love? Anybody who you work with? The young sister Parker said, I ain't slept in days. We look at people who feel helpless. We feel people who are irritable. And all we see in the signs of trauma. Now, I'm a psychologist, but I hate psychology. And I'm going to tell you why. Not because of psychology itself, but because how we abuse it. When you look at the book we have, it's a book called the DSM-5. Diagnosis of Statistic Manual. And this is where they put all of the different disorders. But when this book was first created, it was probably about this thick. Five editions later, it's this thick. And the second edition to be a homosexual was a disorder. Well, then the lobbyists from the LGBTQ community boycotted them. And guess what? It wasn't a disorder in the next one. So what I'm saying is these things are variable to change. That's human perception. But I do believe that mental health is real. So hear me well with that. But I think it all boils down to trauma. We can call it anxiety. If somebody's dealing with anxiety, that means you have a fear of the future about what's about to happen, what could be going to happen. If it's depression, it's about fears from the past, those things that linger on us. And anything else is all a mix in between there. And so what do they do? They give us medication. I'm not an enemy of medication. But I think they prematurely give it. They give it before they try every option. And then when they do give it to you, they give you too much. They give you a cocktail where you're like this. And don't nobody want to take it. So you misuse it. You abuse it. If it's properly used, it can be helpful. But it's too many other ways in which it can't be. And when you have a society where you say, I can't trust it, it becomes scary. 
So when we think about our government that we have, the FDA, the CDC, the EPA, when we look at all of the things that they allow to let happen, we say, do they care about us? So when people have vaccine hesitancy, I understand. So I trust the science, but I don't trust the scientists. If I don't trust the scientists, how can I say that you don't know something that's better? I used to sell cars. I was a car salesman. And if somebody wanted to buy a car, we make them wait. We tire them out. We go in the back. And in the back, we would be talking, laughing. We call four banks. And we got deals with all these banks. If we hit two more deals with this bank, we get the bonus. But this bank got the highest interest rate. So when we go back out to the people, which one we give them first? The highest. Now, if they say they're going to leave, we say, oh, hold on, wait, come on, let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. So I tell you about to buy a car, never go for the first deal. If they say, oh, okay, because they want it. So was it that they, it wasn't a better deal? No, it's the people who was giving them couldn't be trusted. And when we look at the environment that we live in, when we look at the world we live in, so many people can't be trusted. And it's not because everybody's bad. It's just a walking contradiction. Everybody in this room just about was singing, I believe I could fly. And we sung it with all our hearts at graduations and cried. But now don't nobody want to sing it. And I'm not excusing what R. Kelly did. I thought it was atrocious. And if it was my daughter, I won't even tell you the rest. But I'm not going to cancel him because it's me. he's a walking contradiction. Just like George Washington. How many people canceled him? Yeah, he was a great general. Yeah, he did great things with starting the country. But look at all of the other ill stuff he did. I want you to just keep these in mind as we keep talking. Which line are you in? Which line are you in? When we look at cognitive dissonance, this is the second point that Abra talked about. This is when you have opposing thoughts in your mind. That's why we go to that comforting lies. This is why we don't tell ourselves the truth. This is why we can't believe what we want to believe. When we talk about cognitive dissonance, this means I got two thoughts in my mind, but they don't make sense together. Like back in the day, they'd tell you, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, a smoking will cause cancer. But I love the smoke. I love what it brings to me. So, so, so it creates this dissonance in my mind. Now, the one reason why people change is because of a paradigm shift. But a paradigm shift comes in, in so many different ways. Sometimes we think people have changed and they really haven't changed. People change because of pain. If you put your hand on a hot stove, what are you going to do? Take it off. But if that stove went hot, it, it's no pressure. So, so hear what I'm saying. Catch these metaphors. If it's hot, I'm taking it off. But if it ain't hot, I'm going to keep it on all day. Pressure. You know what? If you don't have this so many minority contracts, we're not going to give you the deal. But as soon as that pressure is gone, what happens? The only reason why people have a paradigm shift is because their perspective have really changed and they move from a cognitive dissonance to a cognitive consonant. So I want you thinking about this. When you hear information, can we accept this? But it's three reasons, really four, why people won't accept information. And this is the world we live in right now. So when we talk about cognitive dissonance and why people stay in there is because of this. Let's say somebody tells me, let's use the smoking analogy again. They say, my grandmama smoked till she is 98. That's all the evidence I need. Now forget all the studies that was done through Harvard, through, through, through uh, uh, all of these other centers. That's all I need is that one piece to validate what I was thinking. So now you think about the world we live in. How can they believe that? How can the sheep think that? Because if I don't want to believe it, all I need is one piece of evidence to keep me in that state of dissonance, to be able to make my mind go to consonance. Another thing is I don't like the source. Bill Cosby said, A, B, and said, oh, no, 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 no. you done stopped already. Just because it comes from a bad source doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad thing. But what do we hear all the time now? Fake news, fake news. So no matter even if they're telling the truth, 
we've already put it in their mind where we've planted that seed. It's fake news. But now you know why some people don't go to dissonance from, from consonance to from dissonance? Because they say, hey, this is just my team. How many of y'all, if your mama do something wrong, you still rolling with your mama? See, if, but think about this. What if mama wrong? But I'm still rolling with it because that's mama. But think about how many people had an ideology in life what they tried. I don't care what they did that you was wrong, but you mine. If we don't have the courage to tell even the people who we love, hey, you wrong. Hey, I ain't going to abandon you, but I ain't riding with you on that. And if we can't do that, then we got to have some understanding why other people can't. And you know why some people don't move to consonants? Just because they're scared. Few, few, few months ago, I heard this chant. It was called, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence. A few weeks ago, I saw Mike Pence on a television program. So let's not talk about January 6th. That's not big. That's not important. Let's talk about what's going on now. And I'm thinking like, wow. These people came to hang you. They had a gallows. They had guns. They had zip ties. They breached the Capitol. They fought the Capitol Police, and your own president wouldn't protect you. How many of us here? See, I give us examples of things that's kind of outside of us. But when we start talking about we want change from other people, we got to ask ourselves, how are we guilty in those same ways? See, we want them to do right, but are we willing to do it ourselves? Franz Fanon is one of my favorite quotes on cognitive dissonance. And what I want you to think about when you read this, when you see this, when you look at this, is say, how many times are we going against our own best interests? How many times because of the mind that's been indoctrinated that we can't even see the things that we're doing to be complicit in our own oppression? This is why they don't want CRT taught in schools. I heard the young lady question today asked Mariah. She had talked about Condoleezza Rice. And she was like, well, we don't want to hurt the white people feelings. I don't want to hurt nobody feelings purposely, but sometimes the truth hurts. You know really why they don't want CRT taught in the schools? Because those young developmental minds, if they hear the truth, it's going to have a different level of thinking. And for the powers that be, they can't have that. And the ironic part is most of the people fighting against CRT, they fight against their own best interests and so many other things. They've hijacked that narrative. They don't even understand what it means. Because if you go back to critical race theory, the first thing what they're going to tell you is that there's no such thing as racist. There's one race, the human race. But what they say is because of the different ways, and Brother Elmer talked about this yesterday with Carl von Linnaeus and Johann Blumenbach when they talked about putting these different species upon the racist. That was a way to what started to divide us. And with that division came what? Disunity. There's masters of mankind. There's a small sect of people who really run the world. And they know if they don't want the rest of the people to come together, we have to make them fight each other and think they're opponents. And most of the people who we don't like, most of the people who we think we hate, most of those people are really the people we need on our side to team together to make things right. When we start to look about things, I want you to think on these things real carefully. They don't want to hurt the white children's feelings. Well, they didn't care about hurting little black kids' feelings. They didn't hear care about hurting little Japanese kids' feelings when they put them in a tournament. It's not about hurting feelings. It's about telling a truth. And when you look at this screen right here, think about this. I was born in 72, so I've never had a chance to see this. But listening to my grandmother from Houston, Mississippi, Chickasaw County. She would tell me stories that would make me mad. She would tell her stories that would make me cry. Like I couldn't even believe it was true. And I think about what it took. There's a, a shirt that I see sometimes and it, and it just pisses me off. People say, I'm not my ancestors. You'll get these hands. I think, I'm like, how stupid could you be? How disrespectful could you be? Because if it wasn't for what our ancestors did and put through, you wouldn't have the mindset to think like, oh, I could protect and defend myself now. It was what they went through. And what I want you thinking about when you see this is think about how history has a way of changing itself to make you think different. 
Because when we think about the indoctrination of ourselves, if they can make us think disrespectful of our ancestors, what else is going on? How can you be mad at one flag and not the other flag? Burn that Confederate flag, but that one old glory still have 50 states and 13 of them was those original states. When I see them, I look at them both with the same type of venom because the other one at least stated who they were. Hey, we the South, this is what we want. What did Martin Luther King say? Just be true to what you said on paper, but this flag still not being true. But yet we'll wave it, we'll love it. Tell me who's ever sung the national anthem better than Whitney Houston and Marvin Gaye. We still invest in it's the walking contradiction. You reading that? Or you can't see it? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I can't see, I ain't got on no glasses. Let me get down here. It says, the forest was shrinking, but the trees kept voting for the ax because its handle was made of wood and they thought it was one of them. The people who we think on our side, we think helping us. The very ones helping to destroy us, but yet we keep what? Helping them. It says, <laughs> bad politicians come because good citizens don't vote. This is from Ghana. This is not America. How many times are we against our own interests? And this is cognitive dissonance because we're forced to believe. I have a lot of friends in Milwaukee who are politicians, and I like them. But I'd be wondering, like, man, is it like what Mariah said? It's just not anything they can do? Are they caught up in the system too? It's a whole lot of different things to think about. These are my boys. And we talk about the contradiction that causes Stockholm Syndrome. And I love this quote by James Baldwin. He says, I love America more than any other country. And he said, and exactly, precisely for that reason, I will perpetually criticize her. But when I thought about it, I said, why I love America more than any other country? When I got countries back home that really love me, but I'm trying to force myself in a place that already told me they didn't want. Think about how many times, if you watch the documentary, I am not your Negro. Done 50 years ago, it talks about the assassination of Medgar Evers, of Malcolm X, of Martin Luther King. And you watch that documentary from yesteryear and believe it's today. And what did Derek Bell say? The more things change, the more they stay the same. We keep pushing ourselves into a system that showed us it never wanted us. Unless we would be as captives, as slaves, as doormats. I don't celebrate the 4th of July, but we go to cookouts and they had that flag and I took a picture with my boys I was like, put that flag down, put the fist up. It's the walking contradiction. I love America. I do. I'm here. I'm a citizen. And you know how I kind of make this make sense in my head? I said, my people built this place. I'm a citizen of the world. I still love Mother Africa. That's my home. But I go everywhere and we built this, so I'm going to make it ours. So if you don't want to make it, we're going to get into that. I don't, I'm still in my slow mode, so. This is the big one. So oftentimes, I hear people that look like me criticize people that look like me because we bought into this narrative. Remember the cognitive dissonance? Yeah, they are kind of lazy. Yeah, they don't really want to do nothing. And we say these things about the people who look like us because you know what we're looking at? We're just looking at the tip. And it's true, if we take self-accountability, there's some things we can do that could be much better. There's no question about that. But the real question is this, what created those situations? And why are we penalizing the people for doing, like we talked about the young people with the uncooked brains? Why are we then now penalizing people 
for systems that we know for centuries have put them in a situation to act exactly how they're acting. I want you to think real on this. Oh, me too. That's me. Here I am when I work with the box and how I tried to rationalize it in my head was, we going out in the community, we talking to the kids, we, we giving back. Me, Bill Clinton, I'm like a little giddy kid. No, and I don't like none of his policies and the things that he did. But in the moment, I was like, this was the president. What, what do you do? But I see the contradictions within myself. When I knew it was time for me not to work with the Bucks was the last time I did the drive. You know why? Because I was going to these white owners. I say, boss, this black one good. He big, he strong, and he ain't going to cause you no problem. He going to be good for Milwaukee. And I looked at myself and I said, who are you? And I didn't like myself. Yeah, I liked it, some of the trinkets. I see that ring they had. You think I don't want that ring? But I don't want what comes with that ring. So when I look at myself, I have to be honest. I look at this right here. It says Giannis makes $193 a second. 556000 a game. Now, when we think about income inequality, and I love Giannis, he's one of the, the best people you'll ever meet. He's sincere. Everything you see on TV is true. But who deserves that kind of money? But that's what they want us to picture us on. Now, let's think about this. In the NBA, they have what? A salary cap. He maxed out. That's the most he can make. What's the salary cap of the owners? See, when they bought the team, you know how much they bought the team for? $550 million. At the time, it was a record. People were saying, <laughs> people were saying, this is crazy. This is ludicrous. The team is now worth $1.86 billion. Remember that land they got for $1? They was like, well, because it's a lot of stuff that they got to fix up over there. So we're going to give them that. They'll fix it up, revitalize it. And I'm not saying this to hate on the bucks. What I'm doing this is to challenge them. Remember we talked about charity versus generosity? If they really care about the community, let's see how much they give back and what they do. Abra told me I got five minutes. I can't believe this. I work with the Badgers now with one of my contracts. Madison has just been voted the number one place to live in America. But I want you to think about this. I had to do a presentation with one of my colleagues and they put this up on the screen. He put up a thing telling students what they should not do. And he put up a person's tweet and it had the N word and it had the F word. And so I wrote about it, but I tried to cross it out to make him feel like he wasn't being persecuted. And I talked to him. And he said, I'm sorry, I didn't know. And I'm thinking, wow. We just had a person fired here two years ago for this. And we just went through all of the Maude Arbery and George Floyd stuff. And they put out a thing saying Black Lives Matter. And we're going to be careful about it. This was the real slide. Now, imagine being in a meeting with freshman students as a presentation. And this is the slide that's presented. What do you say to them? Well, of course I snapped, but in a very polite way. But what I was like is, why was I so polite? Why didn't I say really what I meant? And it's because of that Stockholm syndrome. We talked about capitalism. I want you to look at this right here. And I myself, I'm either on the bottom rung or the second rung. Either way, I'm in trouble. When we look at the way our society is set up, it's set up for disaster. It's set up for destruction. It's designed for the status quo to remain the way it is. Pardeep, who did the prayers, one of uh, a friend who I, I love to death, and his prayer was perfect. But unfortunately, a lot of our religious societies don't implement that same type of thinking, and they're part of the problem. But what I want you to think about is this right now.
Remember this on January 6th, they told us it was a civil war. Before the Boston Tea Party, before the American War was the Boston Tea Party. When John Brown, that man said, I must be blood in October of 19, excuse me, of 1860, he created something at Harper's Ferry, something that was very similar to Nat Turner's rebellion. And that's when he gave that quote. But that was one of the preludes to the actual Civil War. Remember the South always say the South will rise again? World Trade Centers was almost blew up in 1993. A van came through. It didn't do it. But what happened in 2001? The frown on the face of the gold would not stop it from being taken to the market. We always say we're going to speak truth to power. What we say, we're going to bring action to power. Give me liberty or give me death. You're going to either die literally. You're going to die by your career. You're going to die by little bitty things that matter to us, those creature comforts that we want, if you really fight the power. And I'm asking you, how many of you are willing to do that? Hey, I'm going to get going. I'm sorry. Okay. I want you to think about short-term results. What can you do? We need, well, I'm going to go back to the immediate results. If we're going to solve this problem, we need immediate results. We need short-term results and long-term results. With the immediate results, what we're doing right now, we're doing good things. The starfish theory. All of them on the beach. The one picks up the starfish, throws it in. And people say, well, you can't save all of these. He said, but I can save this one. We're saving one, and that's not a bad thing. And I want you to think about that. Is when you see the garbage people come out every week. If you've ever missed a week of your garbage collection, oh, it causes havoc on you. And it don't seem like a lot, but what we're doing is sort of like that. And that's okay because it kind of keeps us at bay. But that's what allows the system to go. So if we keep doing that, we're going to keep doing it. With short term, we start thinking about bigger things. What can we do? Now think about from living in 1820 to 1920 to 2020. It's a big difference. But goes back to Derek Bell. Still, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I don't want my children and grandchildren to have a poverty summit to be talking about this. But if we do exactly what we continue to do, that's what's gonna happen. When you look at this, look at those billionaires who names you just know. Collectively, the Waltons, that Sam Club, own $100 billion. How, how, how can we even allow this to happen if we really have a democracy and the democracy is for the people? Why aren't the people fighting? We say we can vote. Well, why won't we vote for it, for things to change? because we really don't have to vote the way we think we do. And what I want you to start thinking about is this, to get mad with that. We cannot be complicit in our own oppression. Consider history. Bacon's Rebellion, how many people are familiar with that? Bacon's Rebellion is really what helps to get enslavement period the way we wanted to know. Nathan Bacon didn't care nothing about black people. He was an aristocrat, but wasn't at the highest level. And when they wouldn't let him in, he gathered all of the poor people, all of the black people, all of the white people. And he said, let's go against him. And he declared a declaration of independence from England in 1676. And guess what? They won. They burned down Jamestown, Virginia. But a little bit later, he died of dysentery. And when he died, they were able to back overcome the group. And what they said is, oh, we lost, but you know what we know? Oh, he, he done showed us the, the, see, the key. If all these people get together, they gonna come against us. So they said, you know what we gonna do? We gonna divide classes, we are gonna divide people. And as long as they fight against each other, they won't come against us. Now let's go back to 1920. Spanish flu, war, war was just ending. 
2020, 100 years later, what's going on? Afghan just ended. And if you say that's not a world war, I tell you, then, then you don't understand. Because if you don't think our enemies was helping Afghans on a covert manner, the same way we was helping the Afghans when they were fighting Russia, then we have to understand global policy a little bit more from a geopolitical standpoint. But I want you to understand that they had an immigration problem. People were flooding in and they was like, we don't want these people here. KKK was at one of his highest points. John Meacham in his book, The Soul of America said, as a quote to Mark Twain, he said, history may not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. So what I want you to think about this is let's think forward. What happened in October, 1929 with the stock market crash, followed by the Great Depression. How long we think we can deal with this income inequality right here? And this thing not come crashing down. We look at the news and they say the stock market is doing good. Look at the, the NASDAQ, look at the S&P, look at the Dow Jones. Most of us not even in it. And we thinking and fool that like that's something that's good. But this is what I want you to see. You never change things by fading the existing reality. This is from an architect. To change something, you got to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. What does Sister Black say? We got to equip. We got to connect. We got to dismantle. We know that the system is not designed for us. We know it's overperforming. You've ever heard the saying, this is not chess. I mean, this is not checkers. It's chess. Who in here like to play chess? But if you like to play chess, you know it's a game of attrition. So if we play in chess and we're in a minority of population, we're already losing. We're in a minority of, of money. We're losing. So what you have to do is not play chess or checkers. It's a Chinese game called Go. And what Go is is about there's no pieces on the board in the beginning, but each person puts a piece on. It's a black and white piece with the two players. And what you want to do is capture the most land with the fewest pieces. See, it's not a game about attrition. It's a game about intelligence. And see, I am advocating dismantling this system, but not in a way in which most people think. If you look at Sun Tzu and his work in the art of war, he said that the best way to be in the battle and to win is to never be in it. You subdue the enemy without even knowing. It's a story about a samurai warrior who was old, undefeated. And then comes this young warrior says he wants to fight him. He wants to challenge him. The young warriors, Adam and Adam and Adam, the old warrior says, no, 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 until the young warrior insists. The old warrior says, okay, let's go. We're going to go out to the island. We'll roll out. Whoever comes back clearly is the winner. They get in the boat. They roll. The young soldier jumps out. He's ready. He's warming up. The old man just rolls back in the boat, goes back to shore. So when we start thinking about how we want to fight this battle, I want you to think about this. And Malcolm X is famous for saying this. He said, illness, he said, when we replace that I with the we, even illness becomes wellness. This was all white when I first got it. That's my kindergarten coloring. But when we start to talk about who seems to get the worst of the worst, it seems usually the darker people get it worse. And then other people say, well, that's just them. It's not me. But look at this right here. Martin Luther King said, if we don't learn to live together as brothers, we will perish as fools. Every society has burnt itself down. And I'm going to leave with this story right here because this is what's going to happen to America if we don't do something. There's this man. He wants this rare coyote wolf. It has this tremendous fur. He doesn't want to shoot it. He doesn't want to hit it with an arrow because he doesn't want to waste any piece of it. So he's starting to think, what can I do? Because this coyote wolf has like the, the intelligence of a dolphin the blood sense of a shark, the quickness of a tiger, of a leopard. It's impossible for him and his humanness to defeat it with his hands, and he can't use any of his weapons. So what he starts to understand is, I have to outsmart him. 
And so he says, I know he has an insatiable appetite for blood. So what he does is he goes into his natural habitat. And then the rock, he cuts out a piece. He says, why is he cutting out this piece of the rock? It's this hole there. But on the other end, he's made this knife. It's a double jagged knife. And it's full of blood. And then he freezes it. Then he gets a little bit bigger of a bucket, puts water in it, freezes it again. So now it's like, you remember those old suckers we used to eat? You had the bubble gum in the middle. You had to lick on the top. It's looking like that. Now he pours it with blood on the top and it's dripping. And he slowly goes over to that rock, gets some, some cement, puts it in, just goes laid back in the cut. The coyote wolf smells it. He comes out. He licks the blood. The insatiable appetite is there. He licks now at the ice because he can smell the blood beneath. He chops through the ice to get to the blood. The coyote wolf is smart. He understands what the knife is going to do. But his insatiable appetite for the blood won't allow him to stop. And so he licks the knife and the blood until he's licking his own blood. But because he has an insatiable appetite for blood, even his own blood, he licks his blood until he bleeds out and dies. And so I tell you that story because I need you to be creative on how we're going to defeat the enemy. Because if we think we're going to defeat the enemy in a regular position from a physical bloodshed war, mm -mm. think about this. We said every society has come to an end. But well, what society has ever had nuclear capability? You're telling me if Nero had the atomic bomb that the whole world wouldn't have went down with Rome? What I want you thinking about is this, family. We talk about this poverty summit, and we buy into this. This is the cognitive dissonance, because we've let America tell us that money is what creates poverty. And it's not money. How does, my, how does America judge us? Oh, I've hurt you. I've wronged you. I'll give you a million dollars. Killed your son. I'll give you $2 million. Oh, I hurt your car. I'll get you another car. You get the money, you buy it. Everything is evaluated in money. How much you pay, how much you get earned. And we bought into that. As long as we buy into this system, we're going to continue to fight this system the way they want to. We're going to be unsuccessful. I need you to use your brains in a way like we've never done before. And the only time people usually use their brains in that manner is when their life is on the line. But you know what? We're too comfortable. Look at us right now. About to eat that good dessert, get into our luxury car, go into our nice homes, pass the people who we want to help. We're complicit in the problems ourselves. When you look at Gandhi and he recognized what was going on here, he'll change his whole lifestyle. If we're not willing to do that, what was the last theme of the day? If you are too weak to overcome the habits that are obviously bad for you, then indeed your future is bleak. Family, we have everything that we need right now to do something great, to do something beautiful. To make this summit great, you know what we got to do next year? We got to invite more people. That's supposed to be at the table, like Lumumba said. But not only the people we like, the people we don't like, the people we don't agree with. We got to make sure that this is a challenge with everything that comes with. Because if we're not willing to be uncomfortable, if we're not willing to stretch ourselves, the more things change, the more they remain the same. But if I'm comfortable and they just like that, then how are we any better than the people in the structure we try to put down? I didn't get through all of the slides and Abraham hey, will come back for free and talk about that when we talk about the I, because that's going to be the key to let us know why we do some of the things that we do. I apologize for not getting through this in the way I was supposed to, but family, I love you. And like I tell you, the one thing I can say that I've never said at a keynote before, I'm here with you. I'm willing to die with you. I'm willing to die for you. And let me tell you this. I'm going to tell you like, like Fred Hampton, I ain't going to die on no plane. I ain't going to die on no bus. 
I'm going to die for the people because I love the people because I'm going to live for the people. So if something happens to me and they say it was suicide, I believe that it wasn't. Not that I can't, but just know that my voice is going to be strong, but my actions are going to be stronger. And if I got some army people with me, oh, collectively, we can do something together. But we got to be willing to give our lives. Family, I appreciate your time, your attention, lift your ears. I thank you. I love you. We're going to make something happen.